Your protective style may not be protecting a damn thing. In fact, it could be damaging your hair and killing any length retention that you receive. So today we are gonna be grading protective styles according to your curl pattern. What grade is your go-to protective style gonna get? Is it gonna get an A? Is it gonna get an F? Keep watching. So yes, this channel is all about skincare and how to get and maintain better skin. However, obviously your scalp is skin and your hair grows out of your scalp, so it's an extension of that, so here we are. Joining me again today is board certified dermatologist, Dr. Crystal Agu. Dr. Agu is the director of the Ethnic Skin Program and associate professor of dermatology at John Hopkins School of Medicine. She's the author of the new book, 90 Days to Beautiful Curly Hair, and she's a new mama, congrats again. Now the last time she was on this channel, she dropped some major gems, so again, you know, you go ahead and get you a pad and a pen because you won't be jotting. And let me go call Dr. Agu and get our conversation on. So I'm going to set the stage by saying when we talk about protective styles and the damage that they may do, right? So people can understand why I may give something an F versus an A, right? So two things that we got to be on the lookout for, traction alopecia. Most, most women are aware of that. They're like, okay, I don't want it to be too tight, things like that. The other thing that we have to think about is hair breakage. And that is the takedown process. So think about when you're removing a style and how much hair is coming out. Some of that is shed hair, but I, you know, I've personally been that person who's taken down my hair and I've had like a bunch of hair in my hand. And I'm like, uh, is this all shed hair? Right? And it's not, some of that is actually broken hairs. And so when your hair is too dried out from a protective styles, when you take it out, it's more likely to break. So when I grade things, I'm gonna be talking about its ability to cause traction alopecia and its ability to maintain the moisture in your hair. The other thing I wanna say is how we grade um, protective styles differs based on if you have like 3B hair versus 3C hair or 4B hair or 4C hair. And then if your hair is high density or low density, right? Because someone with high density 4C hair, one protective style may be an A for them, but if you're low density, it might be an F, right? And you guys are both 4C. So those are things to think about. And so I'll try to go through that as I'm talking about uh, style. So knotless braids. So knotless braids are great because they're going to be low tension styles, right? So they're less likely to pull on your hair when you install the braid. So this gets, I would give it a B for traction. And the reason I give it a B is because if you have high density hair, it's going to be great, right? So you, maybe you're more like an A. But if you have low density fine hair, then it's probably going to be more like a B minus or C, right? And so knotless braids are great um, in that they're not going to pull as much as traditional braiding styles. But if you're someone who's at risk of, for traction alopecia, um, you still want to avoid it. As far as drying out the hair, knotless braids are going to be less likely to dry out the hair than some other protective styles because if you're still using braid spray, you can get braid spray along the length of the hair as it's tucked inside the braid. And the braiding hair that we use for knotless braids is silkier, so it's not going to pull away moisture. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that. It's a, it's a lot. So, it's yeah. A lot so, so box braids, what, what would that, like the traditional yeah. box braids, how would that differ? The traditional box braids are going to be similar. Um, so I will say this, sometimes I have women who come into my office and they have a lot of breakage. They can't get their hair to grow past a certain length. And, and it's because, you know, maybe they're natural and they're having a hard time or they're trying to transition to natural. And I say, look, you can do box braids for a little bit to kind of transition you into kind of taking care of your hair more readily because the hair is going to be silkier. It's not going to dry out the hair so much. And because the individual like, you know, patches of hair that we're attaching the box braid to are larger, it's going to pull out less. So I can, I like box braids for high density type four hair and most women with type three hair, right? Um, low density 4C, and even low density 4B, I would avoid box braids because the, the risk of traction alopecia will be higher. 
Okay, so the difference between high density and low density hair is that um, in pertain does that pertain to how thick the hair is or how many hairs are, are present? Yeah, it's really how many hairs you have, but then also the texture. Okay. Mm. So if you feel your hair and you're like, it feels almost like wire, it's very coarse, that hair is resilient. Okay. It, it, we say the word coarse and it sounds bad, but it's good. If you feel your hair and it's like, it feels like cotton, like cotton candy, that's low resilient hair, right? And cotton sounds good, but in this scenario, it's actually bad, right? It's just not going to be able to withstand the force. From a scientific perspective, it means that it's missing one layer of hair, okay? Mm. You can have anywhere between two and three layers of hair. People whose hair feels more wiry, and I'm talking about my type four hair, right? Coarse hair. If it feels wiry, it probably has three layers. If it feels soft, it has two layers. Uh, in the same kind of realm, faux locks and some of these like crochet hairstyles. Yeah. yeah. What would you grade those? Yeah, faux locks is going to be probably more like in a B minus range, only because the hair that's used for a faux lock is harsher. It's drier, okay, than like your canacalon. I don't know how everybody says it. Canicolon. I mean, that. It, I think that. Listen, you're doing better than me because I would have been like, kick, 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 whatever. Right. I would have just, just had it on the screen and pointed to it. Right. <laughs> okay. So that, um, so that hair, right, that actually is not going to pull out moisture a lot, right? So that's why box braids are okay. Faux locks, it's, it's, it's more wiry, it's drier. Mm. And so that it's more likely to wick away moisture. So for me, I, I like faux locks for my type three girls and my type four A. Once we start getting on a four B, four C, regardless of your density, I, it's not my favorite, right? But if you're four A type three, um, where your sebum is gonna coat the hair more easily because you have fewer curls, mm. then that's okay. And then my type three girls have to worry a little bit less about um, the traction alopecia unless they are very, very low density, right? If you're very, very low density, you still got to worry about that. But faux locks I like for my type threes to 4A. If you're yeah. 4 C, I'd rather you do box braids. This is really eye-opening because I never thought of the actual hair being used drying out your own hair. Yeah. And this is why I, we have you here. Absolutely. And like I said, I, you know, I have this new book coming out 90 days to beautiful curly hair. I literally do this. I'm like 3A, 3B, 3C, 4A, because it's not a one size fits all. And it's hard because think about if you have a group of five friends and you guys all are natural and one girl has faux locks and you're like, oh my God, it looks gorgeous. She takes it out, all her hair's, you know, still in place. And, you know, you try to do it and it pulls out all your hair it is, it's frustrating, right? And you have to think there are many different characteristics that are going to determine what hairstyle works best for you. Crochet hairstyles. Like the, exactly. they usually use synthetic. Yeah. yeah. It's usually synthetic. You cornrow the hair first and the, the cornrow is great because instead of, you know, one braid pulling at the hair, you have one braid, but it's pulling along the entire length of the cornrow. So that tension is, is distributed along a whole length of a cornrow as opposed to a patch of hair. Crochet braids for traction are gonna be, are gonna really be like an, a grade A, okay? Very, very low traction inducing hairstyle. Where, where crochet braids are going to hurt are for women who are noticing breakage from dry hair. So if you're one of these people who you deep condition your hair and the next day it feels like you did nothing, you're not gonna to wanna to do crochet braids because all the ends of your hair are braided into the cornrow. So they're not accessible by even like a moisturizer. And then many forms of crochet hair are very, very drying, right? So it's not the cankalon hair. And so it's gonna pull away moisture. So you may notice that your, your edges look okay, but you're getting a lot of breakage. And so in that mm. respect, if you're someone who is really, really dry hair, so this is really 4B, 4C. And in my book, I talk a lot about 4C plus hair, mm. right? Because 4C plus hair, we don't even see on the blogs, right? I just see it in my clinic, right? These mm. are people with super, super tight, curly hair. A lot of my patients who are like direct descendants, immigrants from Africa, the Caribbean, 
you see that 4C plus here, I'd really have you stay away from crochet braids because it's really gonna cause a lot of breakage during the takedown process. Okay, so I'm not as familiar with the type of hair that is used for like crochet or knotless braids or, or what have you. Um, are there, you mentioned the Kankalon hair, is that the like the gold standard or are there yeah. others that That's are like better? That's like the Justice, Janet Jackson, original braid hair, Brandy for in the 90s. That's the Kankalon. Crochet braids are really variable. You can have some crochet hair that's like cankle on hair, but a lot of women, you know, like this kind of Marley hair, you know, some people call it like Marley braid hair, where it looks like a twist out, right? Mm. You do the crochet and it looks like a twist out. And that hair, it maintains a twist out formation, but to do so, it's kind of like very, very dry and rough. Mm. And what if people use... I don't think it's as common to use human hair for braids or these crochet styles, but I guess it is possible. What it's about human possible. hair? I don't think it's as common. Um, I think yeah. most people are using the synthetic hair. I've really, it's possible, but I think it's probably a lot more expensive and people end up doing like a weave or something like that. But is that type of hair, is that gonna have the same type of like drying effect no. that eventually breaks? Oh, okay. Great segue again, so in weaves. Yeah, so sew-in weaves. Um, so sew-in weaves, really mixed back. Sew-in weaves are going to cause traction alopecia, right? So they're gonna they're gonna get knocked down a grade for that, right? Um, very very classic cause of traction alopecia. And then you know you could sew your hair hair in multiple ways. If you're gonna do a sew-in weave, it's gonna be best if you can do your cornrows horizontally because the, tr the tension is gonna go from here to here as opposed to here to here, okay? Um, and so that's one thing. If you have a net, the nice thing about a net is a net is going to decrease the amount of tension. So you're gonna be less likely to get traction, but more likely to get that breakage because it's gonna be harder to moisturize the ends of your hair. So sew and weaves are a tough one. I'm gonna give them an overall grade of a B minus to a C. Um, mm. they look great. Um, you know, obviously they look very natural, especially if you have a good stylist who's putting them in, but because they can cause traction alopecia in many women who wear them and because it's hard to access the ends of your hair, um, I'm gonna, yeah, knock them down a peg for that. Yeah. And, you know, we talked, uh, we've talked before about dandruff and how to control dandruff while you're wearing a protective styles. It's easier to control dandruff while you're wearing box braids. Um, than when you're, when you have a sew-in. I used to do sew-in weave like it was my job. Oh, yeah. And then I remember, and I have a good hairstylist, but you know, things can happen. So I had an issue where she took down a style. This is going probably about, maybe about like six or seven years ago. And she took it out and I had like these little <laughs> ball patches on the side. And I was like, wow, what are we gonna do? And mind you, I was getting ready to be in a campaign for a hair company, right? Like I got like patches of hair missing. So we both looked at each other. We was like, look, just shave the side. <laughs> so yeah, I just shaved the side. And I did one of those like um, undercuts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was the weave queen, okay? I have longstanding traction alopecia. Now I'm losing my edges because I had a baby. But yeah, you know, go back. But you know, like I was a sewing queen, right? And then in the late '90s, early 2000s, we were all doing it, and that's why some of these newer styles came into place, right? Because people are looking for alternatives. That's why crochet braids became more popular, knotless braids, things like that, alternatives, wigs, even right, wigs when done the right way, um, mm -hmm. because sewings are so damaging for so many of us. So I had a sewing um, in January, well, December, January. I had like a kinky curl kind of one. Uh -huh. I only kept it in for maybe like three or four weeks because after it was so big that after a while I was like, okay, I got, like I can't see. Like I know. <laughs> I'm gonna say you only kept it in three to four weeks. By the way, like if you keep in a sew in three to four weeks and actually be good, I do know women who can grow hair in a sewing, right? Yes. They keep it in for three to four weeks, they deep condition it every time you know they're putting it in. And at three to four weeks, it's not gonna cause a ton of traction it's not you know their hair is still going to be moisturized a little bit from their previous deep conditioning and so there's a, a, a smart way to do it yeah and I did like that one in particular because it was very very similar I have 4c hair I would say that I'm probably somewhere probably close to the high density mm -hmm. well my hairstylist is always telling me like you got the nerve to be tender headed with all this hair right well <laughs> high you density. can't barely see because it's in a you know the slick bag 
But um, I like that one because it matched my texture so much. So when we had the leave out, I had to do very little manipulation to get it to match. Perfect. Whereas before when I would wear the straight weaves, I would often have, first of all, I would have like the little halo thing around here where the hair around here would yeah. either broke off or wouldn't grow. And then all of the hair back here is like so much longer than the little parts here. Yeah. And then I would have like where the hair was like almost like uh, thermally, uh, what do you Damn. call it? When you, yes, yeah. thermally damaged from using the flat iron. So yeah. I, I just stopped doing it all together because like, even though I don't wear my curls out often, I don't want to compromise them. So absolutely. Great idea. And that's the thing is some people will do, you know, I, I lived this, right? You have your sew and weave and your leave out's the most damaged part of your scalp, right? You're natural, right? You, you braid all that up, but then the weave is straight. And so you're flattering this every day and the hair is just this long forever, right? And then you can't even wear your hair because this part's natural, this part's straight because it's been mm -hmm. heat damaged. And so, yes, it's very complicated. Now, speaking of wigs, lace front wigs. And then I would love to kind of get your perspective on whether the wig is glued down yes. or like they're using like the strap, like the glueless kind of method. Yeah, so glueless method all the way, okay? Lace front wigs um, are very similar to some of the other styles that I've mentioned in that for people who, like they can be very, very protective right? For people who are already suffering from thinning, a thinning hairline, the wig can still pull out the hair, even if you're not using glue. Um, but certainly the glueless method is a lot, uh, is a lot safer. The other thing is if you're going to do a wig and you want to get the most bang for your buck, as far as hair health, take it off every day, do a leave-in conditioner multiple times a week, you know, have it in braids, but once every one to two weeks, deep condition it. Really take care of your hair underneath the wig and then it's amazing. Then it's an A, right? Mm. What I find in my clinic is that, you know, people have the best of intentions when they start, right? So they're wearing a wig and maybe they are doing the leave-in conditioner, deep conditioning, but then things get busy, right? And so then instead of doing the takedown on a regular basis, the hair underneath, I've had I've had seen women who've had the hair underneath braided under a wig for months, three, four, five, six months. And it's just a matted web of hair, right? Yeah. Don't do that, right? You really, if you take care of the hair underneath, you can, your hair can really th thrive with a lace yeah. wrap with a glueless method. With glue, glue will really, can really, really pull out your hair and very quickly, if you remember the stages of traction alopecia that I talked about with you before, very quickly, you can go to stage three, permanent traction alopecia that needs a hair transplant in just a matter of weeks, right? Especially mm -hmm. if you get an allergic reaction to the glue. So, you know, the people like the glue because it feels more secure, right? If you live in Chicago or something, right? <laughs> the wind is like- Going with the wind. Right. <laughs> And you're like, I got to do the glue. In that case, I just feel like a wig might not be your best styling option. Um, so yeah. if you're going to do the wig, make sure it's glueless. It took me a while to transition to wearing wigs, um, especially after wearing weaves for so long. I always just kind of felt that it was like, I don't know, this is not my thing. But now, like, I, I love a wig because especially being on camera and what I do for a living, I don't have time to comb my hair. I don't even have time to comb my hair yeah, it's on my downtime. We're busy. Right. But one thing I have noticed though is um, I don't do, I have never done like the glue on my wig. I've tried like the got to be spray yeah. and that didn't, that lasted maybe like five minutes. Maybe I did it wrong. I don't know. But what I will say is that one thing that I was not cognizant of because the wigs come sometimes with the, the little combs yes. in the front and in yeah. the back. Now I started to have thinning here and I didn't realize it until it was too late. I'm like, oh shoot, I'm not even clipping the, the using the clip to clip my hair down, but it's still like rubbing up against here and breaking my hair. So I cut those out. So I have, you know, my hair is kind of, you know, it's coming back over here. Yeah. But one thing that I have noticed that, well, I didn't notice it because I can't see back here, but my hairstylist noticed it uh, last week when I went in to get a deep condition and everything that and she said i've had it before where the hair was like breaking here yes. on these two sides and i was like i thought about it because the first time it happened i was like we didn't know what happened 
um, we were like, maybe it's stress. But this time I'm like, I thought about it. I'm like, wait, I wonder if it's because the back of the wig has like these bigger combs that I'm not using, but maybe that's rubbing up against it. And I sleep on my back with like, and maybe sometimes the scarf or the bonnet can be rubbing up against there. Yeah. So a lot of times I, it's like, I speaking for myself, I can't speak for anyone else. I can get really complacent because I'm busy. I, I'm trying to get things on camera, right. I'm trying to do things on camera. I would love to wear my natural hair out, but to be able to get my natural hair ready for being on camera, I'm not gonna be able to push out yeah. the kind of content that I can. But to the people listening, it's like, you gotta be cognizant of, you know, things that you're doing, it may seem harmless. Like I wouldn't have thought that the, the thing in the back would be cutting oh. up my hair, but it's like, I don't, I don't sleep in a wig. I, I don't even wear a wig every day. Yeah. But yet it still caused that issue. And the other thing is, is like for a lot of us, our curl pattern's a little bit different in the back. Yeah. So it dries out more easily. And you're right. Mm -hmm. We're kind of, you know, we're sleeping on it and things like that. And that can pull it out. So even when you're doing everything right, this mm -hmm. area is a problem area. Um, yeah. And, and so I, I will say, you know, before we, we sweat segue into our next styling, your your hairstyle right now, I'd absolutely give an A plus. And and for people who are watching, she did not run her hairstyle by me. You know, she didn't ask me what to do, but I, I saw this and I was like, I literally gave a talk at our national convention this weekend. And I put up pictures of a bunch of different pr pr uh, protective styles for dermatologists to see. And I was like, this, these are bad, these are good. And your style is one of the ones I did because you're, you're natural, right? Your hair is easily accessible, right? And it's you're able to add hair in without damaging it, right? You have it in the back. It's not pulling at the front, right? So you're getting that volume that a lot of us are looking for, but in a very healthy way, right? At the, at, at, I don't know what you'll do after this talk, but presumably you could take that down very easily. You don't have to have a stylist do it. Bec and, and the reason it's important to do styles that you can do at home is because it allows you to treat your hair whenever you need to, right? Mm -hmm. if, you get a style, if you go to a stylist and you get a style and only they can put it up and only they can take it down, it just, it, it kind of handcuffs you, right? Yeah. Um, and so this is an A plus for tension. This is an A plus for moisture, right? So this is a style where you can get a lot of growth. So, so before we go to our next style, like if y'all yes. watch it, this is what you should be doing. <laughs> yes. And one thing I'll add too, because normally I love, I love a middle part. Oh, I love a middle part. But today I was like, mm, girl, go to the side, go to sweep it to the side. <laughs> Another silly thing that I did years ago is I had this phase where all I wore were turbans. And at one point it was the yeah. turbans that were already tied. Yeah. And there was one in particular, it was tight right here. Oof. And it definitely left a little piece of like, a little, a little shump shump in there. It's yeah. starting to come back a little bit with the minoxidil. But um, <laughs> but again, you have to use the minoxidil always. So you know, exactly. every day rather. Exactly. It's it's so hard for us with curly hair because it is important for us to minimize daily grooming, right? We our hair will thrive if our hands are off of it. So I love that you're going through this list because we do have to figure out how can I style my hair so my hands are not in it all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's part of the equation to growing it and and then but so many of the things that we do even when we have our best intentions can still irritate the scalp and, and pull things out and so again like this is it's you're doing a great service i feel like for the community thank you thank you you listen you <laughs> i'm so glad that i went to that um skin of color society yeah. um virtual meeting because i was like i've seen you before in person at events just before and I was very impressed, but you really, you really sold it to me during that meeting. I was like, she has to be on the channel. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. All right. So let's talk about a couple of other styles. So twists. Yes. And you're talking about twists, like twist outs or twist extensions. Um, well, I, I would well, think that twist extensions would be kind of similar to knotless braids if you use exactly, the pinkle on hair. Exactly. So exactly. like when people, sometimes they tw just twist their own hair and they leave it like that for a couple of days oh, and then maybe they'll take it out. Yes. And I mean, that's perfect, right? 
Um, I will say as somebody with very low density hair, that will never work for me because I would look, okay. you, know, I, you know, I think I used this term in, in our last talk, ball head scallywag, right? <laughs> like if you have low density hair, doing twists is not going to look voluminous, but if you have high density hair, it's actually a very cute protective style. And the reason twists work so well is like, you know, we talked about a deep conditioner lasting wash to wash. If you deep condition your hair, moisturize, and part of when you're twisting, you're putting another moisturizing cream on it, it actually keeps the moisture there. So your hair stays moisturized longer than someone who's wearing their hair more loose, right? So like, mm. let's say I'm natural, right? And I wearing my hair in a twist out for seven days. My hair is actually going to be drier than someone who's wearing it in a twist for seven days, right? And so overall, over time, you're going to get a lot less breakage and more length retention. So it's an ideal protective style. You could have your stylist do that. It might last two weeks, something like that. Yeah, my stylist would have to do that because that's <laughs> right. a lot for me. I've done, I've done it a couple of times in the past, but that's definitely something I'm like, Gabby, hey girl, I'm yeah, going to make right. an appointment. <laughs> what about Bantu knots? Yeah, Bantu knots are another, so for people who don't know, Bantu knots are when you twist your own hair and then you wrap it and then you just place that kind of wrapped knot onto the scalp. It's a great protective style because it's protecting the ends of your hair, right? So your ends are not subjected to the elements. The ends are the, the driest part of your hair and that part of your hair that's prone to developing split ends and breakage. So it's really great for that. You want to make sure that when you're twisting it, you're not twisting too tight, right? Because mm. you can twist so tight around the hair. Like if, it, if you're putting in the Bantu knot and it feels painful, then you got to take it down. But otherwise, if you're doing Bantu knots with your own hair, also a great protective style. I'm going to assume wearing your hair in a bun can be similar to the ponytail. Yeah. In terms so of- hair in a bun, very, very similar. Like you really want to make sure that it's loose. Like when I put my hair in a bun, you know, I don't, you know, make it super sleek, right? Which it means you're going to lose some of that, you know, effectiveness. When we see buns on social media, um, they're really, really high, high buns, very, very slick and sleek. I don't put any gel on it. Gel can actually dry out your hair over time and break the hair. So if you're going to do a bun, make sure it's very loose. Don't make your ponytail too, too tight. A low bun is actually even better, right? So when I go to work, I, I really don't wear my hair like this at all. This is for YouTube, right? Yeah. But if you do a bun, <laughs> do it low into the back so it's not going to pull too too much on your hairline. I've seen alcohol-free gels. Is that a better alternative? Absolutely better. And, okay. and honestly, you know, even, even if you're natural, if you use cream and a butter, and put that on your edges and then just put a scarf down 20 minutes, it's going to sleek your hair back a little bit, right? So if you can do that as opposed to gel, it'll mm. help you in the long run. What about, okay, so our last protective style, uh, roller sets, so like rod sets, yeah. um, I don't know what other kind of, set. I guess yeah, people use like the different, roller sets. Yeah. yeah. Those are great. And so those are things that you're going to do, you know, presumably on wash day. So you're going to have high levels of moisture in your hair. And when you're putting those sets in, you're actually kind of holding that formation together. It's a good style to get you wash to wash. I like it mostly because it's low manipulation and your hands are out of your hair. But, you know, like I said, the twists are going to hold the moisture a little bit longer than something like a, a flexi rod set or a roller set. Um, but overall, all of these things get an A. I realize I stopped giving grades out. It's like twist might be like an A plus, right? The ro flexi rod sets, roller sets are still going to be in the a, a range. What you have going on here, that's an A plus, right? So we have a couple A pluses, some A's, buns, regardless of how you wear them, are still going to be in the A range, right? Because we're not doing added hair. Um, and uh, so you're still going to minimize the amount of tension. And then because you can take it down easily every night, you can still moisturize it. So you don't have to worry about breakage from moisture. Now, a question that was related, but not related to this, when you mentioned low density versus um, high density, I think I already know the answer to the question, but I just want to ask it just so, you know, we're clear with uh, people watching. If you have low density hair, can you get to high density? Is there something you can do? Oh, great question. 
Yeah. So it's a great question. So you cannot increase the number of hairs that exist on your scalp. Okay. So part of it is predetermined already, right? If, if you have, if you have like, I'm going to just make it simple, one square centimeter of scalp and you have 10 openings, you were born with 10 openings per square centimeter. There's nothing that's going to make you develop 20 openings. Okay. So part of that is predetermined. Um, but can you make your hair look fuller? Yes, absolutely. Um, because if you're breaking your hair, then it's going to look less full over time, right? And so that's why women who, who are naturally born with low density hair, they might have the 10 hairs per square centimeter as opposed to the 20. You have to keep every hair that you have, right? And so you cannot afford to get to lose a little through braids or sewing weaves or wigs that are kept on too long. Um, you have to retain all of that. And so you have to have an ideal hair regimen. Protein conditioners, the reason I end up recommending protein conditioners so much is because the protein can plug in holes in along the hair shaft that make the hair look thinner. And so the hair looks plumper between mm. washes. So those are all things that are going to make the hair look fuller. Even shampoos that say they are thickening shampoos, they actually do work. They work to increase the appearance of fuller hair. So you have to do a bunch of tricks, right? You have to minimize yeah. the footage and then you have to do these things that are going to make the hair look fuller if you have low density hair. Okay, and these are things that obviously aren't permanent. These are just kind of like temporary fixes. Yeah, and then also as we age, our hair becomes thinner, okay? Mm -hmm. So, you know, even though you have high density hair, I'm sure when you were a kid, your stylist was telling your mom she needs to pay double, right? Yeah. Her, you know, she's like, your daughter's hair is so thick, like you gotta, I gotta up the price, right? And that's because when, so, we talked about the number of holes in the scalp that always stays the same as until the day we die, right? Mm -hmm. But like, let's say when we're born, our hair is three finger worse, you know, uh, in width, obviously it's not, but this is just for demonstration. Mm -hmm. As we get older, our hormones slowly bring that down to two and then down to one, mm -hmm. right? So sometimes people will say, gosh, when I was five years old or when I was 10 years old, I couldn't even get a ponytail holder around mm -hmm. my hair, right? I just couldn't do it. Now I'm 35 and I can go around twice. Like, yeah. Look, right. And I'm doing everything the same. And part of that is just aging. aging. Um, so that happens too. So, all right, guys, sorry. If your sorry. hair is, is fine, there's some temporary things that you can do, but temporary. you're not going to be able to go from fine hair to, you know, very voluminous hair uh, exactly. naturally, so permanently. Yeah. Now, if you're someone who's, you, you like, let's, like, there are some people who don't even know how much density they have because their hair has been broken for so long, mm. right? Like they, their entire life, they've had very broken hair because maybe they've braided their hair their entire life and they've never worn their hair out ever. I know people like that. And mm -hmm. then they have an epiphany and they, you know, minimize the protective styles. They take care of their hair. And then they're like, oh my God, my hair's actually really thick. That can happen. So your hair mm. might be thicker than you realize if you're someone who hasn't, you know, uh, had like a healthy hair approach for most of your life. You may be surprised at how thick your hair actually can get. Listen, I told y'all she was gonna be dropping them gems. I hope you were jotting. What did you learn from today's video? Now, make sure you don't forget to check out the description box because I'm going to leave a link where you can pre-order Dr. Ago's new book, 90 Days to Beautiful Curly Hair. Also information on where you can find Dr. Agu on the internet, where she practices, the other books that she's written, some courses that she offers as well. All of that is gonna be in the description box. And for those of you who don't know where the description box is, you know, I'm gonna put a little diagram to show you where the description box is here on YouTube. You may need to get on your phone or your laptop or your computer to get to it, but you don't wanna get to it. Now I'm gonna leave you here with two videos. The first being the first video that we did with Dr. Agu where she kind of politely told us that biotin doesn't work. Yeah, watch that video for that tea. Also, I'm gonna leave you with a video that we recently did on taking care of dry scalp because what you might do in them oils you're using may be making the situation worse. So check that out and I'll see you in my next one. Bye guys.